Thank you, Uma. And uh, it's a real privilege and an honor to be able to make my presentation to you today because uh, I feel that I am a student. I don't try to portray myself as an expert in anything. I'm not a professional archaeologist. My background, as Uma said, is in journalism. So it's my job to be able to take this vital, important information that, that's really vital for all of our people and to try to make it accessible and understandable, put it in everyday language, and that's what our magazine is about. What I want to talk to you about today is the lost history of black Americans. I'm talking not only about the blacks that are here north of the Rio Grande, but through our entire American continents, north and south. It started for me when I traveled through Mexico about 11 years ago. And I went to a place called Tres Zapotes, or the Three Shoes, which is on the Atlantic coast of Mexico. And there I saw, in a museum, this magnificent sculpture of a stone head, nine feet tall, weighs 40 tons, magnificently done of, obviously, a black African portrayed in a kind of a helmet or a crown. I learned that there were about 18 or 19 of these which were found all along the coast of Mexico, and that they were all reliably dated to 1,200 years before Christ. In other words, 3,200 years ago. They belonged to a civilization called the Olmecs, that's according to the literature of the black experience here. Why do you need the word Negro? That's a word meaning the black living south of the Sahara Desert in Africa. And these are not Negro. But here again, you remember the black Madonna? Mm. And the Madonna and child, which you see here, that's the strictly old man. Out of the Veracruz state region in Mexico. So, in the whole Mexican modern civilization, of all of the Americas. Now, from the, before comes a change, and then the purple who we take it back to the heart, and to the real creation story. So you know that America, the name America is a indigenous word, a Mayan word, meaning paradise. Mm -hmm great head, I thought, well, this couldn't possibly, possibly be a black American, but it, it looks like it. Then I investigated the others. I saw the others. that are there. They also portrayed different black Americans, some with full features, some with thinner ones, different, different individuals. And yet the archaeologists tell us that no, there was no one over here from either Africa or Europe or Asia before Columbus. That is what I was told when I went to school. And it's what the archaeologists and what the establishment teachers still tell people, that there was no contact between the Americas and the ancient world before Columbus. I found that beyond this collection of these great stone heads that belong to this Olmec civilization, that there was a lot more information which is not getting out to the general public about this previous black civilization. And it was a black civilization that was here. Now, to give you an idea when this civilization flourished 3,200 years ago, what was going on in the rest of the world at that time? Well, there was no Europe. There was only part of Greece. Troy was the big, powerful city at the time. There was no Rome. Egypt was a great power. And there was a power going on in China. But more importantly for our discussion here, there was also a great power here in the Americas. We call it Olmec, the civilization, the first known civilization. It means rubber, and it refers to a great ball which these people used to build, make, for a sacred ball game. Then they saw Rad. They seized him, squeezed him, and burned his tail. They made Rat's eyes bulge, and his tail have no hair. And it's not your calling to plant the cornfield. What, what are you telling us? I'll tell you, I'll tell you right away, but, but, um, oh, oh. First, give me a little something to eat. 
We'll feed you later. Oh, oh, oh. All right. Your calling is the same as your father's one hunter and seven hunter who died in Shibalba when they went down there to play ball. You are ball players. Well, the twins were so happy to hear that they were ball players and not farmers. They rewarded Rat. Long time ago, before the time of Christ, the people, the Maya people of Guatemala and Mexico, told a story of the creation, of the birth of the sun and the moon and of the sowing of the first corn. It's known as the Popol Vuh of the Kichimaya. A term which archaeologists use just to identify these people. They don't know what they were called. Now, if it was only those stone heads, figure, well, maybe it's coincidence or something. But about 1920, a Polish anthropologist was doing work in Yucatan, right in Trest Zapotes, and he found the remains of several burials of black people that dated back before Columbus in this very same area. On top of that, throughout the rest of the century, smaller sculpture has been found in the Olmec area, definitely portraying black people and related to this first civilization. Now, when these great black heads were first found in 1862, the Mexican, the European, and the American archaeologists said, well, these were just happened to be slaves who were blown overseas and they made statues of them. But yet the local people there, the native people, referred to those as black kings, sometimes as African kings. Also, if you have a slave, you're not going to create this huge, magnificent monument to someone that's the lowest part of society. You only create giant monuments to your most important people in society. On top of that, all of these great heads that were found were not just laying out in the open. They had been ritually buried with reverence, which means that they probably were great monuments at one time, and that there was a period of mourning, and then they were ritually buried, sort of you interred the greatness of this person. To give you an idea how magnificent these stone heads are, I should mention one thing before I forget, too. Uh, the archaeologists say, oh, no, they don't represent black Americans, black Africans at all. They represent uh, a kind of Indians. But they resemble, as you'll see in the slides here tonight, nothing resembling Native American Indians. On top of that, they are all crafted out of black basalt. They're not, in other words, the basalt was chosen specifically to represent a black person, someone with black skin. They weigh 40 tons, and they were quarried in a, a, a mountain area that was 50 miles away, quarried there and sculpted there, beautifully sculpted, and then transported more than 50 miles to the capital of the Olmec civilization. Well, that's why he can sit there. That's all right. That would be the same thing today as if you went, say, out to Gainesville, uh, Georgia, uh, found a boulder, crafted it perfectly, and by hand were able to transport it, this 90-ton uh, work, all the way to the downtown uh, Atlanta area. So whoever did this, they were obviously a great people with social organization on the same par of their artistic achievement. This is by no means the end for evidence of blacks in the Americas. Uh, a mound. A ceremonial mound was opened in the year 1901 in northern Wisconsin, outside of the Apostle Islands. Now, that's the extreme north part of Wisconsin, right on the uh, Upper Great Lakes. When this mound was opened in 1901, the, the bones did not look Native American, and the skulls especially did not look Native Americans. Uh, Native Americans, you can tell almost at a glance that they are Native American skulls because the teeth they meet upper and lower jaws. They have either no overbite or very little overbite. These jaws had pronounced overbite. So when the archaeologists found these skulls, they began to think, well, who do these people represent? 
So from that overbite, they investigated the rest of the jaw structure, the cheekbone structure, the periantals, this area up here, and unquestionably, they belong to black people. Now, to be interred in a mound was a sign of honor. Uh, the average person, the average person uh, in the Native American cultures in Wisconsin, when they died, they were usually buried under the floorboards of the house. <laughs> it went down further and further. You, you, kept them, you kept the family, literally, in your domicile. Or else, if they were common people, workers and so on, they were just buried anonymously in Potter's Field. The mounds were reserved exclusively for regents, kings, shamans, priests, the movers and shakers of society. These four black men that were found in this mound were laid out respectfully with copper goods. Now there's a key there. What were these ancient blacks doing up in northern Wisconsin more than a thousand years ago? And why with copper goods? The upper Great Lakes of our country forms the richest deposits of copper on Earth, among the largest, but more importantly, the richest, the highest grade copper. It appears that these black Africans were in the upper Great Lakes mining that copper. We do know, for example, that the upper Great Lakes area was the scene of a massive, complex, highly sophisticated copper mining operation. It was so complex that whoever these ancient people were, they dug a trench five miles long, were able to drill 60 feet through solid rock to remove this high-grade copper, and they were able to remove, while they were working up there, an astounding half a billion pounds of copper. Now, the Native American Indians, they used copper, it was known as float copper. They'd pick it up off the ground, and they'd make it into bracelets and so on. They didn't use much of it. Somebody was involved in making huge amounts of copper mining. Now, who could that have been? Well, if you look on the other side of the world, there were black kingdoms in West Africa, some of them known as Ghana and Mali. And if you study those cultures, and a lot's known about them because they lasted all the way to about 1400 A.D., when the Arabs came in. These people were great goldsmiths, great metallurgists. They used lots of copper. Now, what's interesting, folks, is in that area of Africa, there are not many great deposits of copper. Where do they get all this wonderful copper? It's also known that these Africans were tremendous seafarers. They had things known as power canoes, in which there were 60 men manning these canoes. Then, on the other side of the United States, in California, you had a black tribe. And I will show you a, uh, a drawing that was made from life, a beautiful illustration from life, of a man decked out in a kind of an Indian getup, but he is definitely not an Indian. He is a black person. What are we to make of all this? These wonderful comparisons. First of all, there is no doubt whatsoever, regardless of what the establishment archaeologists say, that there were sizable numbers of black people in the Americas, and they were not slaves blown out overseas by mistake. They actually had come here for specific economic and cultural purposes. They raised kingdoms here. Um, let me just quote from my notes. I don't like to normally do that, but there's so much information here. My brain is so small, I can't get all this stuff down. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that there was a 16th century historian. His name was Peter Martyr. This was a man who was with the Spanish expeditions to Mexico. He was an eyewitness to the Spanish conquest. And in his chronicles, he writes exactly what happened. And Peter Martyr, who accompanied Balboa, you know, the guy that was looking for the fountain of youth through Florida, they actually saw native blacks in Florida in the year 1513. There was also a priest by the name of Gregoria Garcia. He said that there were blacks on an island north of Colombia, again in the 16th century and that the people in Panama referred to a Negro king or a black king who had just recently died. Uh, Garcia's associate, his name was Bartholomew Las Cosas, he reported blacks in Florida. They even wrote down the names of these black tribes. Um, the black tribes were known as the um, Jamasi of Florida, the Caribbees of St. Vincent's, and the Churusas of Brazil. And they were regarded as indigenous black people. In other words, they were there before the Spanish arrived. When the Spanish arrived, they just immediately enslaved them. 
uh, those that survived the diseases that were introduced by the Spaniards. So very little of what is known about them beyond these reports exists today. Now, since this information has come out, there has been great strides made in DNA. You're all familiar with the O.J. Simpson trial, how they can uh, get blood types down. And in this DNA research, they've been anthropologists, archaeologists, using computers, have been able to trace the different races that inhabited the Americas before the Spaniards arrived. One of the groups they've traced definitely are mongoloid. They came across the Bering Straits. Now, these terms that I'm using have no social bearing. So when I say Negro or Negroid, it's the same I'm using Caucasoid or Mongoloid. These are scientific terms to identify people. They, I, I'm not talking in, in social terms. The people that came across the Bering Straits, we know about, okay, were Mongoloid. Definitely became the Indians and so on. Two, um, at least two black strains, pre-Columbian they call them, before Columbus here, existed in America. One of those strains, those black strains, is unequivocally traced back to West Africa. This is revealed in some of the sculpture, the Olmec sculpture, which shows some of the blacks with a peripheral ridge, barely perceptible, a peripheral ridge around the lips. That is traced to a genetic type found in Ghana. It shows you also how excellent the artist was in portraying a real life person. However, there is another black group, a pre-Columbian black group in the Americas, mostly Along the west coast, California, uh, what is now Acapulco, of a black group of people who do not trace their ancestry to Africa. No one can understand where these people have come from. None of them survive anymore. They do not exist. They have been either bred out of existence or they were the victims of disease or whatever. However, with this new DNA testing, which is now... In other words, all the DNA of every group in the world is now fed into a computer. A computer then can make correspondences, comparisons between every other group. This black group, which they found traces of in the Americas, matches, strangely enough, with Micronesia on the other side of the Pacific to a people called the Negritos. These are black people who trace their origins not east from Africa, but westwards across the Pacific. Now that leaves a tremendous problem. How is it possible that these Negritos or their ancestors could have possibly come across the vast expanse of the Pacific to come here? Moreover, there's a real cultural problem. The blacks that were here in the Americas were great builders of civilization. They were part of this Olmec culture. There's no doubt they were highly sophisticated. They had writing, they had astronomy, they had calendrics, they had a highly advanced uh, system of religion. The Negritos, on the other hand, in Micronesia, are not civilized. They are not sophisticated. They are very low-level society. They are like Stone Age or pre-Stone Age people. Genetically, they're the same as these highly advanced people. But culturally, there's a huge difference. So. For the past few years, archaeologists could not figure out what's going on. Now, to jump to something which the archaeologists, is, it's a real buzzword. It's like the worst thing in the world you can say to them. Some people have suggested that there was, at one time, a great civilization in the Pacific called Mu or Lemuria. Well, that's probably the worst thing you can say to an archaeologist because they regard it as total fantasy, totally made up nonsense. And I sympathize with them because for many years, I didn't believe that such a place could possibly have existed either. Enough is known at the bottom of the Pacific to show there was never a continent there. However, with the end of the Cold War, something very interesting happened. When the Soviet Union was alive and well, or alive anyway, in a big competition with the United States, the Russians and the Americans were busily mapping the bottoms of the sea. You know, it was to fight each other's submarines and so on. So they made these highly detailed maps of the bottom of the Pacific and the Atlantic and the Indian Oceans. Well, when Russia collapsed, the Cold War was over with, and there was no need to keep this privileged information anymore. So Scripps Oceanographic, out in San Jose, California, released these maps to the general public, which means now that you can actually own these tremendous 
perfectly detailed maps of the bottom of the sea. And what they sh revealed was extremely interesting. In the Pacific, we now know, and I will show you on the reproduction of this map, there is not a sunken continent, but there is a sunken archipelago, which is almost as big. An archipelago, for those of you that are not familiar with it, is like a string of islands, dry islands, very closely related, and their base underwater is all contiguous. It's all related together. What these maps reveal are a series of huge archipelagos which are in shallow water and which oceanographers know sank very recently. So recently, they could have been occupied by human beings. So right away we thought, well, there's a candidate for Amu or Lemuria, but still doesn't prove anything. It's interesting, but this really existed. Then in summer, last year only, some divers off the coast of Okinawa, South Japan, by accident, made one of the most fabulous discoveries ever. They found an underwater stone city, a magnificent city that stretches over 300 miles. It is from 100 feet to 20 feet below the surface, which means it's within sport diving range. It has been seen by hundreds of divers. It's been broadcast all over Japan and Europe. And what this city reveals is fabulous. It's hardly able to grok it. It's in great shape. It hasn't been destroyed by some cataclysm like a volcano or something. Either the water rose suddenly somehow, the sea level rose, or some volcanic plate dropped. No one knows how exactly. But this city is made up of an enormous 560-foot-long pyramid. It's not like a pyramid you see in Egypt. It's like a temple based upon other temples in a pyramidal form. You go further north and there are these great avenues, boulevards and streets, uh, steps, archways. I'll show you the photographs now. I have some of the shots of this. And more sites are being found. First there was one site found, then there were three more. Now eight different areas of this are, have been found over a 300 mile area. And that area of Okinawa is part of this great archipelago that sank, the very extreme Asian end of it. And as ex underwater explorers continue, hopefully, the, almost for sure, they're going to find more of these. Now, is this Lemuria under the water? Well, if it isn't, I don't know what else it could possibly be. Now, it looks as though there is real physical evidence for this great civilization that flourished at one time. I, c I can say, too, that these buildings that are found underwater bear virtually no resemblance to anything in Japan. A little bit, but very, very little. They mostly resemble, strangely enough, structures you see on the west coast of the Americas. There's a real comparison between some of the things which I saw and photographed in Peru with which we have photographs underwater in uh, Japan. So. The theory, and a very plausible one, a very workable one, is that there was a Mu or Lemuria. By the way, that name recurs all through Asia. It recurs all through the Americas, where and Native Americans as well talk about their ancestors coming from this place, which they refer to as Mu, or variants of the name Mu. For example, there's a great city on the coast of Peru, and they call that Chan Chan. It belonged to a people who call themselves the Chi Mu. Uh, and on this, I, I, I've seen this place myself. It's available to anybody that goes there. On the walls of the city that belonged to the Chi Mu, which has just been unearthed from the desert, by the way. Uh, they've only seen the tops of it for years. And now archaeologists are brushing away the desert. And they revealed a very long mural on the side of a wall which they call the Palace of the Governor, just as a name to tag on. And along the side of this wall, it appears to depict the different history of these people. And part of this long wall shows a series of pyramids underwater with fish swimming over the top. So the basic theory is this, if you put all the myths and everything together, that here was this great island empire, more than an island, almost a continent, which we do know really existed which still exists, very shallow water. And on this island, mankind, it looks like, evolved more than just civilization, but developed races, specific races. 
And when this land began to suffer from some geologic catastrophe, began to sink, the people left. And they took all their high technology, their high spirituality, and their culture, and they came, many of them, to the Americas. Relatively few, for one reason or another, went out to what is now Melanesia. And the conditions there are very rough, very hard. And over years, over the time, the generations, the blacks there, they lost their civilization just in a fight for survival, and they became, got lower and lower. Whereas the blacks that went to Mexico found an environment far more conducive, the Valley of Mexico, you can do a lot of planning there. There they developed civilization, and it rose very high. What's interesting, too, is that in the past, only the past year, a number of skeletal remains have been found all along the West Coast also of white bone, white people that date back over 9,000 years ago. These bones were first found and the Indians grabbed them from their own and said, oh, we're going to rebury them because they are our ancestors. And the archaeologists looked at them and said, well, that means your ancestors must be white because these bones belong to white men. Then when they did, they did a study of these white bones, these white skulls, they found these were not white Europeans. These were whites that did not come from Europe. Their DNA traced to the Pacific also. So it looks as though this land of Mu or Lemuria evolved at least two different races. And when this island civilization declined and sank into the sea, some of them went north, some of the whites went north, and, and many of the blacks went into the Valley of Mexico and created what we know as the Olmec civilization. Now, why is all this important? And is it just all neat, or is it just exciting? I mean, for myself, enough, it, it's exciting enough. But history, and this history, is very important because it's suppressed. It's, it's not common currency. You go to the colleges or the universities, they will still tell you there's nobody here before Columbus. Well, why is that? Well, an archaeologist, as I mentioned to some of the people here before the talk, archaeologists don't make much money. They can make money if they teach. And what they do, the archaeologist, he makes a name for himself in the field with the idea that eventually he'll go on to the university and he'll have tenure there. Well, then when you get to be a professor, what do you do? You write a textbook, right? And in the textbook, this is your authority, and means all your students and all your classes have to buy that textbook, right? And if it goes on and on, you've got this income. So then in, you, in this textbook, you make sure you don't offend any of the powers that be, to make sure you've got your place there. So sure, only Columbus was here. Then somebody comes along and says, but look at all these black people that are there. Oh, no, that's impossible. No, could, couldn't possibly be there. He doesn't dare admit that because his textbook would be outdated. He'd have to get rid of his textbook. Nobody would buy his textbook anymore. His main source of revenue is over with. But that's a lie nonetheless. Too bad. It's a lie. Um, black people were disenthralled. They lost their slavery status. True. That's physically, that's over with. But if you raise generation upon generation in which you tell your people in America, your only heritage here is slavery, that's it. The white people, they had kings and queens and all that stuff, but we only came from, that is a form of psychological slavery still. It's a form of psychological bondage. And I tell you what, myself, I would rather be a physical slave than a psychological slave. I can, I can rebel against physical slavery. Psychological slavery, that will really mess you up. So. It is vitally important that this information is made available. This is how you disenthrall yourself. This is how you find real respect when you say, okay, yes, slavery was part of our culture. It really happened, but that's not all. And we had people building civilizations here, not only before Columbus was born, but before Spain was born, we had great societies rising here. Then you develop a real sense of self-respect and real uh, connectedness with the land. Now, why is it important to, to me? That's because it's part of my heritage, too. I'm an American, too. And these people that are suppressing this thing about the blacks are also suppressing the thing about Asians being here. And there were definitely Asians that came here, and Vikings and everything else. This is America, apparently, was a melting pot long before the Statue of Liberty came around. The other lesson to be learned from it, and, and, and this is vital, look what happened when the Spaniards came here. They exterminated everybody. They enslaved everybody. They coughed on everybody and gave everybody diseases, wiped everybody out. 
That's the kind of heritage that they did. They, all these previous great civilizations, we don't know anything about them because they scrubbed them clean. That's what, and we're just picking up the pieces now. Uh, and it was hardly any better when the Anglo-Saxons came to North America because when they came here and they saw this beautiful country, do you think they said, oh, look how pretty the trees are in the valley? Well, I, that might have figured it out. You know what they let? Look, I can make a profit out of that. I'm going to make money off of that. And so they cleared the trees, they cleared the Indians, everything else, just for the idea of profit. And they wiped everything out. The difference was is that when the Africans came, and others too, to the Americas, they didn't come with that attitude. Let me give you an example. There's a guy whose name, I can't remember, I have to look it up. Abu Bakari of Mali in the year 1300 AD. Abu Bakari was this black king. And we know, this is not speculative, folks. This is stuff that is chronicled by the Arabs, not by blacks, by Arabs who visited. In the year 1300 AD, he amassed a fleet of 400 ships. You talk about Columbus with his three ships. This guy has 400, a fleet, and he's gone. Mansa Muhammad Abu Bakari II looked out over the Ethiopian Sea. It wasn't called the Atlantic Ocean. It was the Ethiopian Sea. Right. How do I know that? Because I looked at the maps of the, of the 15th and the 16th century. There. And others have looked at it. He looked out over the sea. He said, if we can navigate the Niger, he was the uh, emperor of the Mali Empire at that time. He said, if we can navigate the Sahara Desert, we can deal with that Ethiopian sea out there. So he went to work building. He went to work building with a knowledge which had been preserved by the University of San Corre at Timbuktu and other university systems right there in the motherland. And he sent out 200 ships, 100 with crews of Africans and 100 for supplies to carry them for two years if necessary. Now, I mean, if you think you can go on an ocean for two years, you bad stuff. <laughs> you know something. Because the man loved his people, he was responsible for the people, he was a leadership, he wouldn't send them out somewhere, not knowing where he was sending them. And he told them, say, don't stop till you come to land. I know there's land over there, because our people have been traveling over there ever since the days of the pharaohs, and possibly before. Some time passed by, and only one ship came back. And the ship captain that came back, according to the report given by Abu Bakari's successor, says that his report went thusly. Sire, we traveled, and we followed the wind gust that would take us straight across the Ethiopian Sea. But we reached a place where there was a great churning river, and, a, and, and, a, and an awesome mist. And all the other ships went into that mist and I never saw them again. We somehow got spent out of it and were headed back in this direction, so we came home. So what did Abu Bakari II do? In 1311, I said, thir what, what year did I say? 1310, now we have 1311. How far is that from 1492? <laughs> 1811 now, this black man says, hook me up 400 ships, 200 to carry people and 200 to carry supplies. <laughs> and I'll see you later. <laughs> he gave him five and got in the wind. <laughs> After conferring the emperorship on Mansa, Kong Kong Ganga Musa. He was never heard from on the continent again. But the records of the Aztecs, the Olmecs, and some of the other people there kept recorded that a strange group appeared on their land. Hundreds upon hundreds of black men with gold spears and golden shields, and one tall jet black man with gold in his braids and his hair 
golden slippers stood under a golden pavilion. And the indigenous bowed down and said, Hail, our God, Quetzalcoatl, has returned. Going across to the Americas. And you know what he loaded up his ships with? Gold, iron, and textiles, and feathers. No weapons. He didn't set out to conquer anybody. He went out to trade. He went over there to this rich land to set up trade. And that appears what really happened. These different groups came over not to take it. There might have been conflicts, I'm sure. But the main thrust of all these things was to set up trade in a mutual bargaining system. And that's what created the Olmec civilization. Because Olmec civilization, I don't mean to say it's totally black, that it was something that was created only for black people. But no, the leadership was black. And they used and they cooperated with the native people to create an indigenous civilization. You see, this is the thing where the, our critics, will, the archaeologists will say, oh, Olmec civilization has nothing to do with the blacks because if that was the case, you'd have a, an African civilization that's transported into America. And that's not what the Olmecs are. But we're not saying that, see. The Olmec civilization is where you brought black expertise, black mineralogy, and so on, worked with the local people, and created something different. That was the Olmec civilization. So that is the, the thing to, to realize, that there is a spirit of cooperation. It's through respect. And we have a historical precedent for that now, see. And I think that leads to uh, uh, lessons for the future. They didn't abuse the environment. They created a great civilization that lasted for a long time. Well, that's about all. I don't want to keep you out too long in this. I'm going to show you some slides. And if you have any questions, you can uh, certainly interrupt the, uh, the action here. I think we have to probably douse these lights, though. This is just a simple uh, example of the contacts between Africa, North Africa, and Mexico. I'm going to start off very simply at first. This is an Egyptian god, ancient Egyptian god, called Sobek. And it's portrayed with the body of a man and the head of a crocodile. Now, this does not mean that the ancient Egyptians believe such a monstrosity actually exist existed. This is a symbol of protection. You see, he's there with a little boy, with Pharaoh's son, Amenhotep III. Uh, the, the, the idea of the crocodile's power. And, and the, man represent, the man's body represents the spirit. So it's a spirit of protection. His name is Sobek. Now, on the other side of the world, we have here at a place called Bonampak, which is in Mexico, central uh, uh, Yucatan, you have here a, an alligator-headed man. He has, growing out of him here, a lotus, which is the exact same symbol associated with Sobek, by the way, which is a sim uh, symbol of rebirth, regeneration. He is also a, a guard. This is supposed to be one of the kings, one of the uh, uh, protect a protecting deity. His name was Sipankali, which is not that far from Sobek. This is a, what's a representation of what Sobek would have basically looked like. He's holding an ankh, which is a symbol of life which has also been found in some of the temples in Mexico. And this is the scepter of his authority. Now, here is just one of the 19 Olmec heads that are found all over uh, Veracruz. Now, what's interesting, too, is that all of these black heads have been found uh, in Trest Zapotas. Now, that's interesting because Trest Zapotas was the old capital of the Aztec Empire. So in other words, these were the top guys. Now, the real debate is, what were they? Were they kings, or were they something else? This is a representation of another uh, a badly damaged structure, uh, a statue nonetheless, that was found in a tomb in Mexico. This is one of the common heads that is found also in Vera. Now, it's Interestingly enough, there are a number of these black representations which show no body, show just the head. What does that mean? The head was considered amongst many Mesoamerican civilizations as the seat of the soul, that the body itself was relatively unimportant. The eyes and the head and so forth and the skull were considered sacred. This is a, a representation of what appears to be a god that was found, that has suggested of Negroid characteristics, but it was found buried with 
the bones of a black person, also in Mexico. I'm going to back up here just a little bit to this one again. Now, the helmet or the headgear is goes down over the ears and covers the whole skull quite well. It appears to be made of some flexible material like leather, almost like a football helmet. This is an indication of what this person might have really been. He may not have been a king, but he may have been somebody which was considered even more important. The Olmecs, as I said, had a sacred ball game. Their name comes from the name rubber for uh, Olmec, is rubber ball. This ball game they played represented the course of the sun across the sky. The ball stood, symbolized the sun. And it was played, this game was played by two opposing teams. And whoever won the ball game was considered top, the most important man in society, whoever won that game. Now, things were a little different in those days. If you were the captain of the team, which won, they chopped your head off. Now, that was not punishment. That was reward because it was believed that in the moment of victory, keeping the sun across the sky, if you were immediately decapitated, your soul flew up right away to, to heaven. You became a one of the companions of God, the sun god. This, if this is true, it explains why these heads are shown without bodies and why they were buried. It is conceivable that this is the leader of a sacred sports team who, after he won, after he became victorious, was beheaded, memorialized for some period of time, and then ritually buried. This was needed because the ancient belief was is that the sun needed companions. The spirit of the sun needed companions, sacrifice. And only the best would be acceptable. Uh, the idea that we see in movies that slaves were being sacrificed to the gods, that's not true. You sacrificed only your best people to the gods. It'd be like going to a birthday party, you know, giving them a box of cornflakes or something, you know. If you want to give somebody a gift that's something special, you give it of yourself, your highest uh, gift. So these were either king's regents or they were these ritual captains. However, uh, it is described in Panama that there was a black king. They describe him as a black king. This is a from life drawing made in uh, 1820 of a man in Southern California. And he belongs to a group of people they call the, no, they don't have the name. The name no longer exists. Uh, they died of um, diseases that were introduced the Spanish chronicle, chronicled at least one, possibly two, black tribes in Southern California. Where could these people have come from? Now, this is another typical representation of the blacks that are found in Mexico. This is one that is found primarily in central Mexico. What's interesting, this face portrays West African facial features, most definitely. This is someone who came across the sea in ancient times to help build that great civilization. However, this face shows a combination of West African traits and other traits. The, the mouth and so on supposedly is related to uh, West Africa, the eyes, some, someplace else. So it's a mix of something. Now, this is an idea. I can explain how easy it was, <laughs> easy if you had the brains and the guts to do it. Here we're talking about these great black African kingdoms, Ghana, Mali, and so on. They're all along here. And I told you about the, the great African uh, admiral who loaded up his fleet of 400 ships. Now, if they understood navigation and they understood the currents, which only a civilized people could do, and you had the proper boats for it. You couldn't do this in a dugout. You had to have a real ship, one of those power canoes. You could plug into something known as the Canary Current, which goes right off the coast of West Africa. If you ride that current, you know how to ride that current, it takes you directly across the middle of the Atlantic and takes you directly to the spot where all of these heads are found. This is where they are found, off the tip of Yucatan. It's a straight shot. And you want to go back, you ride the currents back this way. It's a long trip, but it, it will work. Interestingly enough, when Columbus sailed to America for the first time, he used the Canary Island Current. 
uh, when Tor Heyerdahl made his uh, balsa raft called Ra, he also used the Canary Island Current and took him directly there. Now that explains West African origins. This is a photograph from a Japanese magazine, which is, comes out a lot better in our, our magazine that came out a few months ago. This is part of this great sunken pyramidal platform off the coast of Okinawa. It doesn't appear to be anything damaged. This is a, some kind of a step. Goes around this way. Give you an idea of the size. These are divers in the background. This particular feature is about 100 feet below the surface. It's connected to other similar features like this up here so that they, they grade up slowly. It's about 580 feet long. It appears to be a, a series of uh, temples. Under here, there are like square cut chambers. No one has any idea how old this structure is uh, because the current is so swift. Uh, coral has a hard time growing here. If, the, if coral had grown over time, slowly, they'd be able to get some kind of an idea of a date. But the currents are so rough that they, they swipe it all away. Uh, the only thing we have to go on are oceanographers. And they tell us that this area was above water about 8,000 years ago. This is a diver, I'll show you here, swimming in one of the arches. This is about 100 feet underwater also. You see these are massive stones beautifully placed. The diver is swimming in between here. It's about 100 feet down. This is a, a flight of huge, enormous steps. Now, there's no diver in this picture, unfortunately, to give you scale. But uh, a, a diver's height would be about from where you see this to about here. So they're big. Uh, these large steps looked like they were made for processions, uh, not any single man or person. Uh, there's, you cannot see it in the photograph, but there are smaller steps within these large steps. Goes up here, there's a kind of a walkway. Again, this structure is so enormous, you cannot fit the whole thing in one photograph. The best way to see it is in a video, and we do have a video of it. it it's it's mind-boggling. The only way you can get an appreciation of it is when you're swimming over it all. But to give you some idea of the massiveness of it. It's all laid out in very straight, uh, rectilinear fashion. And what it most resembles is this place. This is, a, this is right on the coast of Peru. This is an ancient pre-Inca temple. This is before the Incas. The Incas got going only like about uh, 1300 A.D. This temple goes back at least 100, uh, excuse me, at least 1,000 years before them. And there's a similarity. Notice here again the steps in this. And I go back to, to Japan. Now this is, keep in mind, this is on the coast of Peru, South America. And see there's a, a kind of general similarity in the basic linear outline. The structure as a whole closely resembles this. This is called the Pyramid of the Sun. It's an enormous adobe pyramid. It's in bad shape now, thanks to the Spaniards. It was in much better shape before they came. It's an enormous adobe pyramid that was built by people called the Mochica, again, pre-Inca. This goes back at least 2,000 years ago. Again, you have these kind of platforms and right angles. Give you an idea of the size. There are these people there. What the Spaniards did uh, th this is all mud brick, but if, when it's fired, it becomes almost imperishable. When the Spaniards came here, they dug a huge trench, and they, uh, there's a river nearby, and they, they forced the river to go through and cleaned out the whole inside because they thought there was treasure and stuff inside. And uh, they were right. It was just like a fortune in gold came out. They, they opened up this side and then the other side, and it was, when they got inside, they couldn't find their way around because there were all these caverns and stuff, and they were afraid to get lost in there. As a matter of fact, a dog did get lost inside. So they figured, well, rather than do it that way, we'll just flood the whole thing out, you know? I mean, um, so they opened up a trench through here and on the other side, and they let the river come through, and on the other side, water came in this side, and just a stream of gold came out on the other side. So that's an anecdotal thing, but similar there. This is what that same structure I showed you looked like originally. It was red, too, because it's part of the paint exists still. 
The reason I'm showing it to you is because if you were to see that structure underwater in its completeness, in its entirety, it would resemble this very similarly. So here you've got something in Japan, something in America, with a real close, close call. This is a model of another place, also in Peru, a place called Pachacamac. It's about 400 miles south. This also is very similar to what we're seeing in Okinawa. This is another place in Peru. This is, uh, excuse me, in Bolivia. This is high up in the Andes. Again, very similar to the setup in there. This is this wall that I told you about. Um, it's just been uncovered from the sand. that's more or less protected it for 2,000 years. This is a place called Chan Chan. Belonged to a people called the Chimu. And it, this is the wall of their history. Further down, you'll see how people arrived in Peru and so on. And here, this, at the very beginning, it shows these pyramids with fish swimming over the top. It's another example. There you can see the fish a little bit better. Now, how is it possible that people could have gone across the Pacific, for gosh sakes? Again, if you are dealing with a very uh, competent maritime people, here we have the great civilizations of the Incas, the Mochica, the Chimu, all along here that I just showed you. Over here in Japan, this is where the, excuse me, this is where the sunken structures are, down here. So if you know how to work the currents, you can at least traverse this area pretty well and plug into this area here. So it's not impossible that they could navigate those, but there's a better explanation than these currents. This is a, this is a visualization of what Mu or Lemuria looked like. I wish I could be more detailed. This is a painting which is based on a collective, the collective details of various myths from Asia, Africa, and the New World. And apparently these myths are telling the truth because this painting was made like about, oh, 60 years ago. And yet it's portraying essentially the same type of architecture that we're seeing under the water in Okinawa, again, square cut. Lemuria was a very mountainous place. It was very rich. The people there were extremely powerful culturally. Apparently, this civilization was a good civilization. They did not abuse the environment. The Atlanteans did. That's another story. But the Lemurian people, after they reached this very high level of material wealth, became very interested in spiritual ideas. And it was as they were developing these spiritual ideas that this land began to fight a losing battle with the sea. We don't know exactly what happened. However, Lemuria is on part, and yeah, I say is because I'll show you the map shortly, is on what is known as the Ring of Fire. And the Ring of Fire is this enormous tear, a rip in the ocean bottom that skirts the entire Pacific. It's called the Ring of Fire because it's a ring of volcanoes. Islands are sinking and rising all the time. So what happened was is that somehow this disaster undermined the foundations of Lemuria and the place slowly sank and they had to leave. And what we're finding now in Okinawa are just the, the remnants of this. This will give you some idea what the place looked like. It was beset by geologic violence. As I said, the Ring of Fire is composed of literally thousands of uh, volcanic uh, features such as this. This is another painting of Lemuria that was done only about 20 years ago. And it's an attempt to show what may have happened in its last moments because there are some traditions that some people were killed. Most people got away, but there was like a violent upsurge before everyone could leave. And unthinkable tidal waves overwhelmed part of it. And again, you see uh, the disaster in its final episode. Uh, the area was also probably susceptible to this phenomena, which you don't find in the Atlantic. Uh, the ring of fire produces a lot of gas, which is not incandescent, just thin gas. It only then takes a, sm a slight spark to set off this incandescence, which are these great clouds of fire. 
Now, some of the myths related to Mu and Lemuria talk about clouds of fire which terrorized the people, set the trees on fire, the people ran up the sides of the mountains to try to escape clouds of fire. When those clouds of fire were discussed, first of all, in the myths, the archaeologists said, well, that's just a story, a fable. They didn't know about this incandescent gas which does take place only in the Pacific, so far as we know, not in the Atlantic, where you have violent outgassing. So the last days of Lemuria, you may have had a scene like this. Now, it's not known that there was a major volcanic eruption on Lemuria itself, although it's suggested nonetheless. And uh, again, this will give you an idea of its, its last moments. And then the final tidal wave, as it were. There's a Native American tradition uh, of the Navajo who talk about great waves of water uh, coming in over this land, which they don't identify, uh, the land of their ancestors. It's a wonderful story, uh, even though it's, it's details, sh uh, wish there were details, but they talk about how their ancestors lived on this great island paradise in the Pacific, they do say it was definitely Pacific, with a number of other, what are now known as foreign peoples, but were considered brothers at that time. Really interesting, uh, considered just uh, variations of the same family who are considered now, they say, uh, foreigners and aliens. Uh, and they lived uh, on this island, and then these great waves rolled in. Most of the people escaped. Uh, some did not, and they were transformed into fishes. Now, this is the map of Scripps Oceanographic, which has all these wonderful details of the bottom of the Pacific that were not available to civilians before the end of the Cold War. And what it shows here, from here, all the way out across the middle of the Pacific, are a line of archipelagos that are not deep, which means that they sunk recently. What's particularly interesting is that this area here is actually was at one time actually connected to Peru. So if you had a people developing on this, I mean physically connected here at one time, if you have a people that are developing early races, actually early races of whites and blacks that are not related to Europe or Africa, and the first civilization, it's only natural then that you're going to see parallels of blacks in Peru and in Mexico, because it's no big deal to get there, even if it extends over here. That also makes sense that if this land was destroyed, that you had groups going in different directions. That's why people in Asia have the story of Mu, and why they have why they, some of the Tibetan traditions trace directly back to this lost civilization. They call them the Rutas. And these, this place was kind of engraved, really, in the beginnings of all cultures. Now, what about these blacks that went eventually? Were great seafarers. What do they call them? They call them the Moors. Well. The word, the word Moor doesn't really make any sense in any African language, but if you break it down, it looks like a corruption of the people or the, or the person of Mu, because the R is a determination. It's not the real word. So it would be like Mu hyphen R. So it could have been part of this proud heritage, and it, it seems that way. The trouble is, of course, is that now it's up to us to to try to make sense of all this because the great disaster of these, the modern European infestation of America wiped all this clean. There was a bishop, his name was De Landa, and he was a, a Catholic Spanish bishop. And when he came to the Americas, he was put in charge of all of Yucatan. This is about 1590, I guess, something like that. And he got to be real friends with the Mayan Indians. He said, oh, it's very interesting. Bring me all your books. So they brought him all these books. And their, their books were interesting. They were just long leaves all attached together. And they had the entire history of their people, their astronomy, their science, their folk tales, their medicine, everything. And he put them in a big pile and burned them. Totally gone. Now, he wasn't the only one that did that. You, you, you duplicate that over and over again. The only one that survived out of all that Mayan history is something called the Popol Vuh. The Popol Vuh you can still read today. And in the Popol Vuh, it says, a black people came across the Sunrise Sea to teach us how to work gold. 
It's in the Popol Vol. That's all it mentions. We don't know the rest of it because the Popol Vol isn't really a history book. They just mention that in passing. All this, the real story's gone. But it's enough to show us at least that it really happened. This, I really believe now, is Mu or Lemuria. You cannot ignore tradition. You cannot ignore all these physical remains. Certainly cannot re ignore what's going on in, in, off the coast of Japan. The, interestingly, too, the people that live in Okinawa are different racially and linguistically than the rest of the people in Japan. They don't even regard themselves as Japanese. They have strong roots throughout Polynesia. They just sort of seem to peter out somewhere. You can trace genetically some of the people, uh, the Okinawans, through the Pacific, other Pacific Islanders, and then it seems to vanish. And it vanishes right around here because this area is gone. Well, that really is all I had to show. I don't want to keep you all night. I'm such a fanatic on this that I could talk forever. So if you have any questions at all, or is anything I can, I can try to answer for you, I, I'd be glad to. Really, I've answered all questions. Yes? Ben, um, um, one of the kings with the long profile. Yeah. Uh, no. And the reason why is, there used to be something known, or there is something known, as radiocarbon dating. And that is, uh, they measure the deterioration of carbon over time, and they come to a date. Well, that whole process was built on the idea that there's the same amount of carbon in the atmosphere now as there was thousands of years ago. And it's only just occurred to scientists now, oh, gee, we forgot to take into account that there was less carbon in the atmosphere then than now. And so all their dates are messed up. And so now they're having to recarbon date things. However, uh, the one, the Olmec heads, the guys with the leather type helmets, they are pretty well dated to uh, 3,200 years ago because they've used things other than carbon dating. There's crystals that are in part of the eyes, which they've been able to date, and uh, crystallization that took place, um, and things buried with them, and so on. The one that you're referring to, I think, is rather late, probably like about only 1,000 years ago maybe a thousand years ago, which means there were blacks continuously involved in these societies uh, until the arrival of Europeans. Not quite what? Well, that's because it's probably what we would call primitive sculpture, but it's just as a matter of stylization. Uh, that one is, is also relatively late. You have to figure that the Spaniards destroyed so much that we're lucky to have really anything, you know. Yeah. Uh, I study from an esoterical level, and um, in my studies that the land of Mu and Lemuria was the third root race when we were Andronicus and the sexes split into male and female. And I saw when the island of Sop, if you travel past the Rocky Mountain, that whole fall, part of it slammed against the coast of North America and created that mountain strand all the way from Alaska down to the Andes. And if you cross over the Rocky Mountains, you'll find that everything is different there. The trees are larger, the culture is different there. Mm -hmm. So that was the original part of the land of Mu mm -hmm. that slammed against this continent of North America. And, this, and, and I'm not getting into Atlantis, but this is from my studies on the esoteric and the metaphysical. Level. Right. Uh, you're talking about Rudolf Steiner there. No. No? No. Oh, okay. Rudolf Steiner is not the only someone no, who no. talked about the land of Mu. Right. Yeah, right. Um, I, I'm not really too much in the esoteric of it because I know people differ on that quite a bit. And uh, so I'm just trying to, to find the hard evidence that everybody can, can use to build on. You know, and... Uh, city at Japan, there is also it's something like the Bermuda Triangle that's there over there on the coast of Okinawa, I saw on Florida, and there's another vortex over in that Well, I, I wouldn't be and surprised. Similar, uh, like the, guy, the land, like the equator, if you draw a line across it, they are located in the same location. There seem to be correspondences. Yes, sir. Um, question, I, I was reading this earlier this, uh, as me, uh, earlier this week, as a matter of fact about some bones that were found. Now, this is the other coast now. We're getting over to the east coast. I'm talking about Jamestown. And some bones of some Indians or what were, was uh, earlier thought to be Indians, and now they found out that they were black. Mm -hmm. And they're saying that they were the bones of the black slaves. Right. As soon as they find black like, bones, they, they bones, they start talking immediately about they think they're slaves. Right away, they say immediately they're slaves. And, and uh, you know, I guess that's what I'm saying. They didn't present any evidence that says, okay, these people were 
slaves. Well, it was the same thing with... Right away, they say to say, when they found those heads, they said, oh, they're slaves, right off, without even looking into it. Or when they found the bones, they think they're slaves. But you see, now, with all of the new scientific dating this year, well, it's, it's not possible, you know, they were something else. I just learned here uh, from uh, so, somebody in our audience that uh, there's a cemetery that's been found in New York, uh, a, a, black, a black population, an actual black population in New York that was definitely before Columbus, that they were able to actually trace back the origin of the name, like the word Broadway and Spring Street to the shipbuilding people that were there in New York. It makes a great deal of sense. And I think that that place was probably had to do with this great copper trade, because that was, copper in those days was like what plutonium is to our atomic age, because copper from copper, you made bronze, you made tools, you made the best weapons, uh, so it was vitally important. And I think that this place in New York might have been part of that. And they, they, are, not, they are not slaves, because uh, they, you do not memorialize people, like I say, like that. Um, uh, you mentioned New York. What part of... Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I just heard about it from this gentleman here earlier tonight. Uh, I don't know I, like I, that. I, I'm all new to it. Uh, uh, what we call the Montauk Indians? The Montauk Indians, okay. right. Okay. Uh, well, I think they were on Long Island, north, northern end of mm -hmm. Island, Right. That's where they're. Some pyramids or whatever. That, that the Montauk mounds, Pyramid. Uh, up in that area. And uh, some of the things that have happened to them in their land being taken from them. Uh, they were supposedly mixed with uh, some black population, but I'm speculating as to whether they may have already been uh, black or mixed mm. with black or... I don't know. It, it's really believable. It's really possible, considering all these other ones. I was thinking about the family names today, like Pharaoh and... Oh, <laughs> wow. That's pretty good. <laughs> Maybe so. Yes? Yeah. The rest of the body was no longer important uh, because the, the body just belongs to Earth. Uh, but the head, right, for example, they used to also have skull racks. Uh, you would go into town and you see the racks of all these skulls and you'd say, oh, that's pretty horrible stuff, but it really wasn't. These were all like their saints or their, their top people. And it was a form of memorializing them. And by preserving their skull, it meant uh, this, this person is in heaven now. It's like an assurance that they're with the top sky god now. Well, they had a special Pardon me? I don't know. I, had, I, I can't say, but I know they, they, they discarded it because they didn't consider it really important. It was the head. These black uh, people that are sculpted with these great sculptures, uh, they were all found buried. I mean, the, the, the sculpture is found buried, uh, not just thrown in a hole. I mean, buried with, with grave goods and, and honorably put into the ground. So, uh, you know, they were important people. You must remember that uh, once upon a time the earth was one land mass before it split and the people were able to trick all over the earth. And I saw you can travel underground all the way from the coast of Antarctica to the North Pole. And Tuesday night they had a special on a four hour special on Channel 8 on trekking the Aztecs. Uh -huh. All the way from where they left from the Americas down into South America. Oh my. And I watched it with their Right, right. And, uh, it's, it's really fascinating stuff. I think we, we are on the verge of a new history and that everything that we've been told and, and our parents have been told is going to be thrown out. And in coming generations, it, we're going to have a whole new way of looking at our past. That's one of the great things I think we look forward to in this century is that we can throw away all these wrong ideas that still uh, mess us up and see what really happened, you know. That we all have roots in this country that go far back before Columbus, you know. Yeah. Yes, anybody. It, it was a religion, you know. It was a religious right. Uh, you were a privileged person if you won that. And the person that was engaged in it understood that, that if I win this game, I'm going to be beheaded. Now, this doesn't mean that anything bad happened to the losers. It was you know, just part of the game. But if you won, uh, you were considered a privileged character. You know, and, and it seems barbaric to us, uh, but at least we can, we can understand where they're coming from anyway. Now, that isn't necessarily what happened. I mean, that's our interpretation, which might be wrong. I don't mean to say that just because that's my interpretation, that's what it was. I could be totally wrong on that. It could be they are just monuments of kings. That's possible, too. But I do know they had this ball game, and I do know that they did cut off the heads of captains when they, when they won. Now, whether that's them or not, I don't know, but it could be. It could be. With all the written records are gone, you know. They, they, they did it immediately after the game. 
<laughs> yeah, that appears to be the case, right? Because the Aztecs did. They would they would cut off the the head of the guy right afterwards, right in the moment of his victory, of his triumph. Oh yeah, that was the big finale, you know. But I mean, it was good because the the captain went through a ceremony. He was totally praised by his whole society. You know, the the emperor himself uh, thought this this man was was like God. He was deified, you know. And uh, everybody's cheering at that moment. That was a good way to go, I suppose. You know, I mean, everybody's cheering you on in a way, you know. Uh, but this is to say, this is not to say that this is only what the blacks did. This is only what some did. They weren't all involved in this. They were also involved in a lot of seamanship and a lot of gold. Well, one thing I wanted to bring out too is that, as a matter of fact, the word for gold, interestingly enough, in West Africa, was called. Let's see if I pronounce this right. Gua, guanines. Guanines. That's a West African word. Guanines. For gold. When Columbus was talking to the natives uh, in Yucca in San Salvador, they referred to gold as guaninas. Same thing. Uh, so it's uh, there's a lot of more parallels than I, I have time to talk about here. Well, I thank you all for coming and letting me share this with you, and uh, I, I hope you find our, our magazine worthwhile. The purpose of Ancient American is to get facts like this out. Uh, our issue, as you can see, here is dedicated to this. And uh, we're going to keep telling the truth, even though the archaeologists keep uh, saying that we're full of baloney. But I don't, I don't think we are. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your coming. Y'all all right? Okay, I don't I don't want to bore you with all this stuff. Either. Before I get up to 1492, I got a couple of a couple more dates. Because it's impossible to talk about Columbus without a whole bunch of other names coming up before you. Of course, we know Cortez, Hernandez, Balboa, and all the rest of them. None of them were noble people. They were not noble men. They were criminals. Sea dogs, pirates and deserve no honor from us. But also there is Prince Henry the Navigator, Bartholomew Diaz, Vasco da Gama, and Jan von Rybeck. Because at the time now that they were preparing, when they were about to drive out, and I gotta come back to 1492 and then switch back a minute. I'll be coming back and forth, but you, you can hang with me. The last stronghold of the Moors, who had been there for some 800 years, and as Dr. John Henry Clark said, it was one of the few times that Africans had partnerships with other people, and they came out all right for a while. The Arabs betrayed us in the end. The Jews we brought into Europe helped to get us out of, the black Jews we brought in, undermined us with the Spanish to help the downfall of the last stronghold of the Moorish Empire of the Kingdom of Granada in 1492, the same year that your boy made his travel, got lost. <laughs> when they drove the Moors out of Spain, this is what they declared. We cannot afford to be embarrassed by the superior intelligence of these people any longer. They must not be allowed to get themselves strengthened and come back here again. They, they will never rise again, and the only way to stop them is to go to the lands from which they emanate and stop them. We couldn't do that before because we did not know how to navigate the sea. We did not know how to build ships. But now that we have run them out of here, we can take the knowledge that they left behind, and we can now go and exploit the world. Not explore the world, exploit the world. And in that way, we can continue to ensure our genetic survival. And so, in 1444, Prince Henry, Henry the Navigator leaves out of Portugal and heads down the west coast of Arquebunar, commonly known as Africa. Because the Portuguese were heading for Africa, the Italians and the French and the Germans were still trading with the East, 
But Spain couldn't get through to the east because they would have had to fight the Germans, the French, and the Italians to do it. They would have had to fight the Portuguese to get to Africa. So Spain said the only place for us to go is west. No place else to go. But we got to find some land to exploit or the other nations around us are going to become so strong and so rich and they will whip us and, and subjugate us to them. These are Europeans talking about fighting among Europeans now. Prince Henry the Navigator comes down to the Congo and takes back, begins immediately after taking back four of Mother Africa's children begins to recommend the slave trade from there to bring in and import Africans into slavery into Portugal. In 1487 to 1488, Bartholomew Diaz, another Portuguese, rounded the, the Cape of what they call Good Hope in southern Arkebu land, Anzania, because I don't know where South Africa is. I look on the map, I cannot find it. I know where Anzania is. That's what the people who are struggling there for their liberation call it. Then in 1497, Vasco da Gama rounded that cape and found the route they were looking for to India. What it was, these people were going hungry. They were suffering from diseases. They were de being decimated by the plague and everything else. So they were going to other lands to find medicines, to find other things to, for their own survival. They were not going to carry the light of civilization. They were not going to bring people to Jesus. They were not going for any of those reasons. They were going for economic reasons and strictly survival reasons. That's what it was all about. That's why I say when they tell your children in school about the, the great explorers, no, they were exploiters. They were not explorers. But here's the kicker. I'm going to be back to 1492 in a minute. In 1652, the Dutch East India Company, which was trading in the slaves, most of its money was made from slave trade of African slaves, sent and a naval surgeon named John von Rybeck. And he established the first white settlement in Anzania known as Cape Town. Now why am I going through all that? Because African children there who are compelled by the miseducation system, the white supremacist miseducation system of the USA there, the United, uh, 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 the Union of South Africa, same initials as the United States of America, tell these children that they must celebrate the arrival of Vasco da Gama, Bartholomew Diaz, and Jean von Rybeck. And their arrival opened up the door for the destruction of their civilization and the state that they're in now. Now that is mental and cultural genocide. However, many of us here have no problem seeing that in relationship to Anzania. But we have a problem seeing it in relationship to our experience here in America. And I say, and I hope I can back it up, that to tell our children to celebrate Columbus Day is the same as telling our brothers and sisters on the continent to celebrate the arrival of John von Ryback. The same equation. Now why do I say that? Let me give you a little background on Christopher here. Drop my notes down here somewhere. Hold on, man. I'll be with you. I'm not gone. Down here somewhere. Hold on, man. I'll be with you. I'm not gone. <laughs> Let me get a little background on him. First of all, his name was Cristobal Cologne. He was a Jew. A Jew. His parents were. Jews born in Spain who were baptized Jews, Christianized Jews to survive there in Europe because the Europeans were running the Jews all over. I mean, they were giving them hell there in Europe. I have to say that. He was a Christianized Jew who was born to a mother and father who was in the weaving business. At the age of 14, 
he became a sailor. And it settled in Genoa, Italy. Now, in his travels to the west coast of Africa and other ships he had sailed on, he learned about several things. One, he learned about the Moors having taught that the earth was round from the globes they taught geography when they were in Spain and they were still using now and the, at the universities in West Africa. He also purchased a map that was used by the Moorish sea kings who had mapped out the route going across the Ethiopian Sea coming here to what was later to be Miss Nama, the Americas. This was very precious. You ever read in those comic books about finding a, a map that shows you hidden treasure and people hold it and say, God, that's what he did with that. That's why he could run around saying to the other ignorant ones, uh, the world is round, give me some money and I'll prove it. Well, how you know that? Well, I can't let you know, just give me some money. <laughs> he was selling the information. The economic thing. When he came to, I'm not going to go through the whole story there with him, but when he came to Isabella and Ferdinand, to, with his plan, they originally had rejected him. But there was one person who came and saved the day for Columbus. And his name was Luis de Santander, a baptized Jew who was finance minister to Ferdinand. And he said to Isabella, who said, well, now, I don't have that much money. Maybe I can, to finance a venture like this, I can pawn my jewels. You know we heard in school that she pawned her jewels? No, she didn't. He told her, you don't have to do that because I have a cartel of money lenders. Why did he have a cartel of money lenders? Because one of the few businesses the Jews were allowed to engage in in Europe was pawnbroking money lending. And therefore, they developed a mercantile class which gave them outreach and connections and networking with other nations. So by, they had that hookup that by the time of the Rothschilds spread everywhere all over Europe. And they had to finance every war that Europe went into. There. Now, he goes to his cartel, which consists of Don Isaac Abrabanel, Juan Cabrero, and Abraham Senor. All Jews. They raised $98,000 to get the three ships for Columbus to come over here. On his way over here, he has to stop, go down, because you can't come over unless you went down the west coast of Africa. And one of the reasons why he went to the west coast of Africa is, is a brother he had met when he was there before that would be most vital to that mission that lived in Sierra Leone. His name was Pedro Alonso Nina, one of the most celebrated navigators in the world at that time. Put him upon the ship, uh, either the Pinta or the Nina, I don't remember which one now. Santa Maria, thank you. And they now come over, they're on their way over here, but they don't go further enough to the south and the wind can't carry them directly to Brazil, so they're delayed for some time, and it's an arduous journey. The journey is so bad that the crew threatens to mutiny. And they tell him, if we don't see some land soon, we're going to throw your butt off the ship, and we're going back to Spain.